You're watching The Legal Breakdown. So Glenn, we've got another major loss for Trump in court, this time in Georgia. Talk about what Judge McAfee just did in Trump's Fulton County case. Yeah, Brian, this one is not a surprise because Donald Trump and his 14 criminal associates, his co-conspirators, his co-defendants in the RICO prosecution down in Georgia were trying to maintain that all of the charges should be thrown out because everything they said, all of their words, or all of their expressions were protected by the First Amendment free speech guarantees. Well, Judge McAfee just issued a 14-page ruling saying, no, it was criminal speech and it does not enjoy First Amendment protection. Let me just read you one sentence of what Judge McAfee said. He said, the defendant's expressions and speech are alleged to have been made in furtherance of criminal activity and constitute false statements knowingly and willfully made in matters within a government agency's jurisdiction which threatened to deceive and harm the government. You know, Brian, this would be like if you and I had decided we were going to rob a bank and we were caught saying, all right, Brian, you go out the gut, you go get the gun, I'm going to steal the car, we're going to, let's case the joint, okay, let's do this tomorrow, and then we rob the bank. And then once we're arrested, indicted, and hauled into court, we say, wait, wait a minute. Everything that Brian and I said to one another is protected by free speech, by the First Amendment. You can't use those words against us. Well, that's pretty much the equivalent of what, you know, uh, Rudy Giuliani, Mark Meadows, Donald Trump, and the rest of them were claiming, and Judge McAfee was having none of it. Now, are there other ways that Trump can seek to get this case thrown out? Um, he's been relying a lot on, on this argument of presidential immunity. He brought that forward as a claim in Washington, D.C., which, of course, the Supreme Court is looking into right now. He's trying it also in Manhattan. So could that come into play in Georgia? So it could. You know, we're going to see Donald Trump file motion after motion after motion. Some of them will be frivolous. Some of them will be summarily rejected by Judge McAfee. Um, but, you know, the presidential immunity claim is an interesting issue right now, because even though there's no legal support for it, the challenge is the Supreme Court decided to accept that issue for review. And they're going to hear argument on uh, April 25th, and then goodness knows how long they'll take to resolve it. So it does remain something of an open issue. Uh, the thing is, Donald Trump just tried to put a stop to his New York state prosecution, which is scheduled to go to trial on April 15th with a very late claim that, wait, 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 I have presidential immunity. We have to wait to see what the Supreme Court does with it. And Judge Mershon had absolutely no problem rejecting that and saying, we're going to trial. I do think the same will hold true down in Georgia, but I also fully expect Donald Trump to file a presidential immunity claim and try to convince the court down there to at least hold off until the Supreme Court resolves the case. Um, I, I don't think it matters. It becomes almost an academic question at this point, mainly because of the potential timing of a trial down in Georgia. Right. I, I was just going to say this case is moving so much slower that presumably the issue will already be decided before any Georgia trial date is actually is actually handed down before the Supreme Court actually you know decides this issue one way or the other in late April. So I would say probably. Here's why I say probably. You know, I had a big RICO case that I handled in federal court in Washington, D.C. when I was a prosecutor. It actually involved a comparable number of defendants. We actually indicted some 30 plus defendants. We whittled it down with a bunch of guilty pleas, including guilty pleas with cooperation, people who were flipping and testifying against the bigger criminal fish. We whittled it down to 13 defendants. And then what we did, Brian, is we did three RICO trials. We did six defendants in the first trial, six defendants in the second trial, one defendant in the third trial. So we did it in waves. The reason I bring that up is because presently there are 15 RICO defendants pending trial down in Georgia. I could see District Attorney Fawny Willis saying, you know what, we're going to batch them. We're going to do two, three, four trials. We're going to do them in waves. Batch number one will be Donald Trump, Mark Meadows, Rudy Giuliani, and Jeffrey Clark. I'm just picking four really cruddy names, right? Yeah. Four of the marquee criminals who tried to steal the, the election down in Georgia from the people of Georgia. 
And judge, we're asking you to set that trial date for September 1st. That is an uh, entirely possible. I think it's even feasible. So, you know, they could spend the next several months between now and September 1st resol re resolving all of the remaining issues, any additional motions that the parties might file, and then wave one of the RICO trial could begin on September 1st. I would not dismiss that out of hand. Do I think it's, it's likely, perhaps not likely, but entirely possible? Well, why don't we have a trial date on the horizon in Georgia? Why haven't these prosecutors come forward and said, OK, look, we know that we can't take, you know, 17 defendants to trial at once, but why don't we get this first batch moving? Why, why is this kind of slowed to a crawl? You know, it's a great question because there has been an outstanding request for a trial date for months now. D.A. Willis several months ago proposed, I believe, August 5th, if I'm not mistaken, for the first trial date in her RICO case. And I don't think Judge McAfee has ever ruled on that, has ever actually um, made any progress in setting August 5th or any other trial date. It's a bit of a curiosity. Now, we all know that things got derailed for a couple of months by these allegations about, you know, Fawny Willis's potential disqualification because she had a relationship with one of the members of her team. Of course, that was rejected by Judge McAfee. He did say, listen, I'm going to take some remedial steps and I'm going to suggest or I'm going to rule that, you know, you can clean this up, this appearance of impropriety by having that person, Nathan Wade, um, resigned from the case. And he promptly did that. So I do think that kind of derailed things or, or put the case in a holding pattern, which is one of the reasons I think we haven't seen a trial date set. I do have a feeling now that we just got this, um, this motion ruled on, Donald Trump and his co-defendants trying to get the case thrown out on First Amendment grounds, now that that's been rejected, I do think in the coming days, the next week or two, we may start to hear more about setting a trial date. And, and it has looked like Judge McAfee was moving along pretty expeditiously, prior to this at least, hasn't he? Yeah, he has been moving at a pretty good clip. Delay is not his game the way it is Judge Cannon's game in Donald Trump's federal prosecution down in Florida. I will say, you know, both Judge Mershon up in New York in the criminal case that's going to kick off, you know, shortly here, uh, April 15th, and Judge uh, McAfee in Georgia. And I would add Judge Tanya Chutkin, who I have a feeling knowing her the way I did. I used to try murder cases against Tanya Chutkin when she was a, a public defender in the courts of Washington, D.C. I think she's probably champing at the bit, ready to go. But of course, her trial has been in a holding pattern while the Supreme Court sort of, you know, lazily takes its time resolving this bogus presidential immunity claim. Remember, that trial in D.C., Brian, was scheduled to kick off March 4, but it is, it's been in a permanent holding pattern. But I do think the good news is three of the four judges presiding over Donald Trump's four criminal prosecutions are good, honest, um, diligent judges. And then, of course, there's Judge Cannon. And we're still waiting for a motion to have her removed from the case. Now, you'd mentioned uh, holding patterns here. So let's finish off with this. How come we haven't seen more flips in the Georgia prosecution? Because we had Scott Hall, Kenneth Chesbro, Sidney Powell, and Jenna Ellis all flip at once, and then just nothing. It's a great question, and it's a curiosity to me, because listen, when I was a prosecutor and I had lots and lots of co-defendants, I wanted to flip everybody and anybody I could. And doesn't the momentum help you? Uh, the momentum does help, but, but here's the thing. Let's not mistake um, an absence of flips, that is an absence of defendants deciding to plead guilty and cooperate with weakness in Fawny Willis's prosecution. There's no telling whether some of these defense attorneys have come forward to Fawny Willis and said, my guy wants to plead guilty and is willing to cooperate. And D.A. Willis could have said, we don't need you. We gave you an opportunity yeah. months ago. We've got all we need to convict all 14 excuse me, all 15 remaining RICO defendants, and you're going to be one of them sitting at defense counsel table because you opted not to come in early when we gave you an opportunity. Brian, I, I had that play out in lots of different ways over the years. So I wouldn't mistake the absence of flips with, you know, or equate it with some kind of weakness in D.A. Willis's case. 
perfectly put. We'll leave it there. Obviously, Glenn and I will continue to watch uh, anything that unfolds in this Georgia prosecution as well as the other prosecutions that Trump is contending with right now. So for those watching, if you want to follow along, please make sure to subscribe. The links to both of our channels are right here on this screen. I'm Brian Tyler Cohen. And I'm Glenn Kirshner. You're watching The Legal Breakdown.